Okay, so um, uh, in this session, we'll um, uh, further things that we, uh, some of the learnings that we get from uh, all these five instances of people being filled with the Spirit and, you know, um, so what else do we learn? What else do we learn from these five instances that we studied in the book of Acts? That the Holy Spirit cannot be, cannot be bought. Okay, so uh, in other words, um, you know, it's not something that we, that we need to do in order to, you know, receive. In the sense, um, our performance, or we cannot earn, you know, we cannot... Um, we are not entitled, you know, saying, okay, I'm living in this way, so therefore I'm entitled to have this. So it, the gift of the Holy Spirit is by faith, as we see. Right? Okay, what else? Anything else? Uh, else? Pastor, can I say something? Um, online students, okay, we learned that Holy Spirit is unique, okay? Mm. Can you expand on that, um, Daniel, um, um, from these five instances, what causes you to come to that conclusion that he is unique? Uh, no doubt he is, I'm just curious what really, mm, what did you observe? That caused you to, you know, uh, make that statement. Okay, Holy Spirit is for everyone and who believe in Jesus. Yes, everyone, all believers. No partiality between experienced, inexperienced. Yeah, yeah. What else? Right. So every time we read about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, something supernatural uh, happens. Right. Yeah. That's true, yeah. And um, and from what we see, these five instances, the the supernatural occurrence seems to be the gift of tongues, right? Um, yeah. Okay, Nina, John, uh, they spoke in tongues. That's true. Okay, and we see that uh, they also prophesied, right? In Ephesians. Uh, we see when Paul lays hands and prays, um, sorry, uh, in, in Ephesus, what we read about uh, in Acts chapter 17, we see that uh, they also prophesied. Okay. What else? Right. So, um, uh, two things. Right. Uh, so what Rinchen is saying is that okay, it's not by our own ability, right? Um, that is true. That the Holy Spirit, He is the one who gives us the utterance, but we are the ones who speak it. Okay. So we can't manufacture or we can't learn, right? The gift of tongues. We can't learn. We can't manufacture. But then, at the same time. You know, it is both the supernatural act which involves the natural. Okay. Why do we say that? Because the Holy Spirit gives the words, but, or the utterance, but it is we who speak. It is the disciples who spoke out. Right? That is something. Okay. Let's look at, um, you know, if you, if you uh, okay, there's, I meant unique because. Uh, whoever received the Holy Spirit, the five instances were different from one another. Okay, so the people were different, uh, but it was the same Holy Spirit. Okay. Thank you, Daniel. Okay, let's look at chapter three. Some common questions that we might have about the, you know, about the whole thing, whole aspect of baptism of the Holy Spirit and, you know, praying in tongues and so, all that. Some questions we might have. Okay, the first one is what Anand asked, right? See, um, in John chapter um, 20, right, the Lord Jesus says, he, he breathes on them and he says, receive the Holy Spirit, right? 
So what was that? If this was baptism of the Holy Spirit that Jesus talked about, so what was that when he breathed on them? Okay. So we see in Genesis uh, 1, I think, or you know, where God breathes and um, it says that man became a living being. Okay. Now Acts chapter, yeah, Acts chapter 2 verse 7. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. There we see that he became a living being in the sense physically, spiritually, everything. He became a living being being right uh, some versions uh, say he became a living soul right so every time god breathes he imparts life right so when jesus breathed this happened after he rose again he breathed on the disciples and uh, what we can infer is that he imparted life to them right that their something which was dead came alive what was it their spirit man right the spirit man which was dead came alive. So we can so we can say that they were born again. Like they walked with Jesus, but Jesus now he is dead, buried, alive, buried, came alive, and now he breathes on them saying, receive the Holy Spirit. We can say, okay, they they were born again at that time. So that's the that's the only thing that we can conclude we can infer they were born again at that time uh, but now sorry um, see being born again also is a work of the spirit right work of the holy spirit yes in a, uh, we can say okay it's a work of the holy spirit um i don't think we can say anything more than that right okay um Okay, but uh, I just want to look at uh, two other scriptures in the same light, you know. When we say, okay, we are, when we are born again, we have the Holy Spirit in us, right? So that's the thing. People say, we already have the Holy Spirit. Then what is the need for this baptism? I already have the Holy Spirit, right? Okay, so John chapter 4 and verse 13 to 14, this is what the Lord says. Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again in his conversation with the woman at the well, right? But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Okay? So he's talking about the everlasting life in the believer because of something that he does or something that he gives. Okay. Then we go to John chapter 7. Okay? Verses 37 to 39. John chapter 7, verses 37 to 39. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Okay? John chapter 4 is talking about a spring. Here he's talking about a river. He's talking about a fountain. He's talking about a river. What is the difference? What is the difference between a fountain and a river or a spring and a river? The most obvious difference is the quantum of water, the volume of water. Right? So here, this fountain is just for the believer. It says that it will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. He will never thirst again. He doesn't have to go search for any other place for meaning, contentment, you know, it's, it's done there. The work is done. But John chapter 7, when he talks about the water, now God, this water, he says, will out of his heart will flow or out of his belly will flow rivers, multiple rivers. He's talking about large volumes of water flowing out and obviously rivers, you know, wherever the river go, Rivers flow, there is life, there is civilization. You know. So a lot of good things happen. So he's talking about other lives being touched, influence. So this is it. We can say John chapter 4 is about being born again, the work of the Holy Spirit in a believer's life, sanctification, consecration, uh, you know, spiritual maturity, Christ-likeness, all that is happening, fruit of the Holy Spirit. 
John chapter 7 is talking about the work of the Holy Spirit proceeding from the believer who is filled with the Holy Spirit, which is touching others' lives, ministry, right? Touching other people's lives, ministering in power and deliverance and signs and wonders and miracles and so on, right? So we see both this. So indwelling, yes, when we believe, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. We read that in Ephesians, right? Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, I think. Okay. Um, yeah, Ephesians 2 and verse 13 says, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So, and we believe we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The Holy Spirit indwells us. That is why we as believers, we are convicted when we sin, right? When we, we experience the joy of the Lord, the peace of God and so on. But there is a difference. The same believer, the Lord wants that believer to be baptized in the Holy Spirit so that rivers can flow and our life can be a life of witnessing with power. Power, when we say power, it's not our physical ability, it's not our natural talent, but it's the work of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, right? Displayed through the believer. Okay, so uh, Anand, does, does it help? Yeah, okay. Okay, so then uh, another question. What about 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13? Okay, in 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13, we see, by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. By one spirit, we were baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we've all been made to drink into one spirit. So we've already been baptized. So what is the need for another baptism? In the Holy Spirit. Okay. Well, it's true. When we look at this whole aspect of baptism, there are three baptisms, not just one, three. One is baptism in water, right? We are baptized in water. The second one is what we see here that we are all baptized or placed in the spiritual body of Christ. When we become believers, we are we are part of the spiritual body of Christ. And the third one that we see is baptism in the Holy Spirit, baptism with the Holy Spirit. So it's not just, the Bible talks about all these different kinds of baptisms, three specifically, water, baptized in the body of Christ, and uh, baptized in the Holy Spirit, right? Okay. Um, another question, why tongues? You know, why, why can't it be some something else? Why can't it be, you know, uh, why can't it be anything else? Why is it tongues? Why is it something that God would you know, do it this way when the Holy Spirit um, uh, you know, come, baptizes people, right? Why? Well, that is how God has designed it. Right? That is how God has designed it. It's, God, it's his plan in his wisdom. But when we look at the benefits, when we look at the you know, what the gift of tongues does for us, then we begin to understand why God in his wisdom has really designed it so that it benefits the believer. We are blessed. And that's the end. It's not for confusion, creating confusion, right? It's because of the flesh that there's a lot of confusion, but that the believer might be blessed, edified, effective, strong, all those reasons. So he has designed um, this whole thing of tongues. Okay. So uh, then another question, is tongues the only evidence of being baptized in the Holy Spirit? What do you think? Yes or no? Yeah? No? Pastor, we have other gifts okay. of the Holy Spirit as what well. The answer, you need to give a reason, right? Okay. So Rinchen says no. I'll ask, Je I'll ask Jeffina, why did Rinchen say no? <laughs> okay, or Rinchen, yeah. Why did... No, is, is the gift of tongues 
the only evidence or is it the evidence of a believer being filled with the Holy Spirit? We just looked at five instances. <laughs> so, okay, Shani says, no, speaking in tongues. So, Shani, what, um, what is your answer, actually? It's not the only evidence. Oh, um, so I got a little confused. You were saying is, is speaking in terms that... Um, okay, the, the increased only laptop volume, okay. Sure. Um... Yeah. No, no, no. Uh, the thing is, um, okay, somebody's trying to, okay, sure. Um, does anybody want to ask a question? Um, if you want to ask a question, you can do that. You can unmute and speak and uh, online students. Okay, or you can just post it on the on the chat, right? Okay, I've uh, yeah, John, I've actually um, unmuted. Okay, so Shani, uh, yeah, go ahead, Shani. I'm sorry. So, what was your question? Is speaking in tongues the only gift of the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Was that what your was that your question? Yeah. So, uh, is speaking in tongues the only evidence, uh, or other? Uh, uh, sorry, is speaking in tongues the evidence that the uh, for the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Is speaking okay, in tongues the yes. yes. Yeah, the answer is yes. So if the question is, is speaking in tongues the only evidence of baptism of the Holy Spirit? Well, the answer is yes, in a way, yes, because we see that it, that is happening. But also, we know that it could be more than the gift of tongues also, right? We, the last instance that we saw in Acts chapter 17 that people also prophesied. Right? They spoke in tongues and they prophesied. So we can conclude by saying all the gifts of the Spirit can actually be manifest uh, at the time of bat baptism of the Holy Spirit. right? Because we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and all the gifts of the Holy Spirit are resident within the Holy Spirit who comes and dwells in us and baptizes us. So... There are no limits, right? But uh, in, in these five instances, uh, it is specifically, it talks about the gift of tongues, it talks about prophecy, and um, you know there are other places where it's not mentioned. So we can safely infer that, yes, this seems to be, the gift of tongues is the most common. There could be other gifts also. We, we can be open to that. But, um, you know, since we see these gifts of tongues as the most common one, we encourage every believer. Okay, so that's the thing. To say, you know, if, if you say, gift of tongues need not be, uh, you know, if you tell me that, then I'll, I'll be satisfied. Okay, okay, fine. I will not, you know, I will not pursue. I will not desire this. I'm satisfied. Right? But the fact is that it's God's desire that all of us um, walk in it. Okay, um, someone else. Yeah, Shani, please. Okay, so I just want to make sure I understand. So somebody can receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and not necessarily speak in tongues. They can have, like you said, to get the prophecy. Is that what is that what you're saying? And not, they, they have to get the prophecy and not necessarily speak in tongues. Am I correct? I want to make sure I'm understanding it right. Yeah. So in the sense, you know, well, people could be prophesying also, prophesying and uh, Maybe initially they don't see the gift of tongues, but that's no reason why they should not pursue and also, you know, walk in the gift of tongues. Oh, okay. Okay. Right? Because uh, in Paul's case, we don't see, we don't, see, I mean, it's not mentioned that he prayed in tongues immediately, right? It's not mentioned. He could have, he may not have, but eventually we know that he did pray in tongues, because we see this whole, um, you know, in, in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 14, the whole thing is about how to, in the church, or for the believer, how we need to function in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, right? And so we know that, and he, he, in saying very categorically in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 18, that I speak in tongues more than you all, 
right? So we know that he eventually ended up praying in tongues. So it should not stop us. Or if we are teaching others, we should also, you know, encourage and say, hey, this is for you. Do not stop. Don't put a, you know, a barrier, a ceiling on your own life because God desires this for every believer. Okay. Yeah, one more question. Oh, okay, Jeffina. Oh, in the chat, is it? Okay. Um, is this correct? Speaking in tongues is a language that only understood to God and not to the people. Okay, uh, just one second. I think uh, Nisha, uh, Nisha Ghosh. So can there be other Holy Spirit signs with the Holy Spirit baptism? Yes, it is possible. Other signs, meaning other gifts, other manifestations of the Spirit. Yes, definitely. Uh, maybe there could be a vision. Maybe there are other things that are mentioned in Scripture. Uh, all the other nine gifts. Um, John Blessy, um, speaking in tongues is a language that only is understood by God, right? Is that what you're saying? That people cannot understand? Well, when we, when we study the gift of tongues, we see that there is also the interpretation of tongues, right? So the Holy Spirit can give, um, cause me to speak uh, or pray in tongues, and then uh, there is the gift of interpretation of tongues. So, um, so what I pray, what I speak for, uh, another person receives the interpretation, interpretation through the Holy Spirit, right? So that is possible as well. Okay. Uh, I think Nina has mentioned the same thing. Okay, for the ones who do not speak in tongues, then uh, does it infer that if we are not baptized by the Holy Spirit? No, we cannot infer that. How would you know if you're baptized in the uh, Holy Spirit? Interesting question. Thanks, uh, Akil Fred. <laughs> okay, okay. This baptism of the Holy Spirit is by faith, right? Is by faith. We receive by faith. Faith in what? Faith in God's word. Faith in the fact that he, the Lord Jesus, is the baptizer. We understand that he is not partial. We understand that it is, this is for everybody. So we go in faith. Uh, we go with the expectation. The only qualification is that I be, uh, uh, I've received Jesus into my heart. That's the only qualifier. That is the only thing that qualifies us. And we go with the expectation. So, um, and, and that's it. Right, so we, so how do we, um, so so when we are baptized, yes, we expect um, all these uh, gifts to be operational, and especially what we see in scripture, the gift of tongues. Okay. Now, for some reason, we could have a wrong understanding. We could have our own expectation of how the tongue should work, right? And um, and probably we don't get started right away. That doesn't mean that we are not baptized in the Holy Spirit or filled with the Holy Spirit. Right? That doesn't mean that. Okay. Um, so uh, I just share one personal experience is when, when somebody prayed over me and uh, I got filled with the Holy Spirit, I did not immediately pray in tongues. Right? I had my own understanding of it. Maybe this is how it will work. And, 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 the, 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 and the thing, mistake with me was, is this wrong understanding was this, that God will somehow speak, right? God will speak that I don't have to do anything. So my mouth was fully, you know, closed and, and uh, God will somehow speak. He'll open my mouth. He will cause me to speak. Well, the Bible is very clear that he will give the words and words are sounds, utterances, and I need to speak it out. So, so those, those kind of things. So um, I hope that answers the first part. So how would you know? It is by faith. Sometimes we feel there's a tangible uh, manifestation, right? Sometimes it's not. So we go by faith in the Lord Jesus and in his word, right? So, for example, in my case, I just thank the Lord that I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the gift of tongues, right? So after being prayed for, after... You know, just thanking, I just went ahead thanking the Lord. So six months after that, I think it was about six months, is when I actually started praying in the spirit. Okay. Um, Shani, I'll just come to you. I'm just saying, um, I'm just seeing. Uh, uh, Can I go or? 
just a minute, Shani. Uh, so can you give some example from the Bible, uh, Stephen Alexander, or some verses? Now, what exactly, example of what, uh, Stephen? Um, example of people who talk in tongues, who speak tongues. Well, those were the examples that the we God saw. language. Sorry? In the heavenly languages. Okay. Not in the earthly language. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, in scripture we see in 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 1 where Paul says, you know, though I speak with the, uh, with the earthly language or a heavenly language and if I do not have love, um, you know, it, it, is, it is futile, right? Though I, speak with the, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, he says, which is, you know, a heavenly language. But if I do not have love, I become... First like Corinthians, Christ. can you repeat? First Corinthians... First Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 1. So he's talking about uh, earthly known language and he's also talking about a language which is not of the natural realm, a language of the angels, which is a heavenly uh, a language of the heavenly realm. Right? So he's talking about both. And he says, though I speak with both, if I don't have love, you know, it's, it's futile. But the fact is that, well, God releases that. The Holy Spirit releases that. Okay, I think there was an earlier question also. Uh, does that help, uh, Stephen? Yes, yes, right now I'm seeing. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Okay. I think there was another question, you know, does, um, uh, is it only for God to understand and, or what about people, you know? So I think this is it. Right? If it is a known language, if it's a known earthly language, yes. And if there are people who understand that language, they would understand it. Uh, but it could also be a language which is not on the earth. Right? If it's a, a language spoken by the angels, if it's a heavenly language, it's a language which is not on the earth, not found on the earth. Um, in addition to that, um, we also see that... Uh, Paul saying, 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 14, that he says, if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. So what is he saying? He's saying that, you know, I'm speaking in tongues, I'm praying in tongues, but I'm not able to understand the words or understand the language. Whatever I'm praying, whatever I'm saying, I don't understand it. So that's a possibility, right? So when we pray in tongues, if we don't understand it, don't be worried. Right? It is scriptural because it's, it's a language. It could be an earthly language, which you don't know yet, or it could be a heavenly language. So the thing is not to be bothered by that. Right? Um, because Paul himself says that if, it's a, uh, you know, if I speak in tongues, my understanding is unfruitful. I don't understand it. But he also talks about how when we are praying in tongues, we are edified, built up. 1 Corinthians 14 and, um, you know, verse, um, um, verse 4. It says, he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. There's a spiritual, um, there's a spiritual strength or uh, construction, you know, that's happening. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. Right? Okay. Um, any any other questions? Yeah. Uh, Jeffina, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. So, um, okay. Um, Shani, I'll just come back to that question. Right. Um, and also Stephen's question in a minute. Okay. So Jeffina's question is this. Okay, so it's based on, um, um, Shani, you want to say something before we move forward? 
Well, yeah, it was just, well, I just had a question earlier because I'm just trying to make sure I clarify. I know you gave the example in terms of the Bible with Paul, how he didn't merely speak in tongues yet. I know I was saying, can somebody have the uh, give a prophecy and then later on eventually speak in tongues? And then you gave an example with yourself on how you immediately didn't speak in tongues because you accepted by faith. So I guess I'm trying to make sure I'm just trying to understand this. So the way I'm interpreting is that you could, you know, accept the bar, I mean, baptism of the Holy Spirit, you do by faith, but you can get, I mean, you start, you can start speaking in tongues six months or a year later. So eventually you will, is that right? I mean, the evidence eventually you will. So if you don't have it now, anybody who has it will eventually be able to speak in tongues. Am, am I making sense? Yeah. Could you repeat the last part? So I, I kind of, from the way, the way I understood what you were saying with your example from Paul and yourself, even if you don't have it now, if you, if you have it later, you will eventually have it. Am I correct on my understanding? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, don't give up in the sense, um, you know, God changes our understanding, our whatever our barriers are. So don't give up because the scripture, scriptural example is that, uh, or scriptural instruction is that it is for everybody. So don't give up. Don't, uh, just because you don't have it here in the now, don't give up. Yes, you're right. Okay. Okay, so I'll come back to your question here, but I'll just answer Jeffina's question. Okay, so Jeffina's question is this. It's based on 1 Corinthians 12. Okay, uh, just before we get into this, uh, we have a course on the Holy Spirit. Okay, all the first time, uh, I mean, all the first year students, we're going to be looking at this in depth, in detail. Okay, uh, one more time. And uh, so I just want uh, want to uh, just mention that. So we're going to be going into all this, right? Starting with the person of the Holy Spirit. Okay, very quickly, 1 Corinthians 12 uh, and verse 28 onwards. Okay, so um, so here's a very interesting, um, you know, uh, it's a, a few verses here. 1 Corinthians 12 and to the end of that chapter. It says, and God has appointed these in the church. Okay, uh, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues, and see, all that is fine. <laughs> I would say amen to that, hallelujah to that. But verse 29, now that becomes a problem. You know, he says, are all apostles, are all prophets? Oh, even here we can say, yes, you know, no. All are, not, all are not apostles. No, all are not prophets. So it's, he's asking a rhetoric question, right? Are all teachers or all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? Now that's the problem. Right? That we say, oh, you know, you, but you just, we just learned that hey, it's for all believers. And we see that in scripture, Acts chapter 2, all the way to 17. We saw that everybody, you know, and, um, so, so how can this be? You know, do all have, uh, do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? And verse 31, he says, but earnestly desire the best gifts and yet I show you a more excellent way. And then he goes on and the message ends on gifts. It ends in, uh, at the end of chapter 14, where, you know, he says, therefore earnestly desire to prophesy and do not forbid to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. Okay, so we're just confused about that, right? So we see that here, verse 28, as it rightly mentions, God has appointed these in the church. So he's talking about ministry appointments. Right? We see um, a similar list in Ephesians chapter 4, where it talks what we call as a fivefold ministry. The apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. Okay, so we see this. God has appointed these in the church, where it's not I desiring and me taking this upon myself, but God appoints and He says, "Okay, I'd like you to be an apostle. Okay, and I want you to be an apostle. I want you to be a prophet." So He appoints, and similarly. When we read through the list, we see that hey, this varieties of tongues or gifts of tongues is also a similar appointment in the church, in the body. Right? So that is why Paul is asking the question, do all speak with tongues? Because God has appointed 
God has appointed these in the church so that people should function. If you look at that, the verses before that, he's talking about the body of Christ. Right? He's talking about the different members, how we cannot or we should not reject one another based on the gifts or we should not look down on another person because of our gifts and so on. The way God uses us and so on. Right? He, he, and in continuation with that, he talks about the appointments. Right? So now the question is this, can I as a believer, can God lead me to start a work, a pioneering work, whether it's a Bible study, whether it's a prayer group, whether it's a church, Yes, right? But does that make me an apostle? The answer would be no. Can God use me to bring a word of prophecy, a word of knowledge to another person? The answer is yes. God can speak through me. But does that make me a prophet? The answer is no. So can I speak with tongues and edify myself and, uh, and also, you know, speaking with the interpretation that I received from God that will edify the others? The answer is yes. But does that mean that's the ministry appointment of ministering in tongues, like maybe intercession and so on? No. Right? So that is what Paul is saying. Right? Hey, these are ministry appointments. These are established in the body by God. Because, he says in verse 31, same chapter, earnestly desire the best gifts. Okay. So what are the best gifts? So normally when we use best, we say, we say one thing. He's the best player. She's the best cook. Right? So he's saying, earnestly desire the best gifts, plural. So what is the best gift of all these gifts? You know, in, in 1 Corinthians 12, he's talking about gift of tongues, gift of healings, and working of miracles, faith. So what is the best gift in that? Sorry? Pastor, yeah. is it uh, discernment? Is it? Discernment. Is it discernment? Discerning. Yeah, thank you, Gertrude. Um, see, the best gift, um, I know we're kind of digressing here, you know, but, you know, if you have different tools, okay, you have a hammer, you have a screwdriver, you have, uh, you know, some adhesive, fevicol, whatever, to drive a nail into a wooden table, what is the best tool? A hammer, right? So that's the thing. The best tool is the one that is most appropriate to solve that problem for that situation to take care of that situation. Right? That's the best tool. Similarly, the best gift, if somebody is in need of physical healing, what is the best gift? Gifts of healings, the gifts of faith, where, or working of miracles, Right? So he's saying earnestly desire. Now, why is he saying earnestly desire? So that? So that? So that you might, so that the Holy Spirit might manifest himself in that way and the need of the person is taken care of. Right? It's for the edification of the church, it's so that others are blessed. So he's saying, earnestly desire the best gifts. Okay. So to answer Jeffina's question, these are ministry appointments. There's a difference between ministry appointments and other gifts for the believer. And I think we need to know the difference, but for us to understand that, hey, these gifts are for the believer. Okay? That's why he's saying, earnestly desire the best gifts. Another verse is... 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 1. He's still on the same topic, the same message. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 1. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. So he doesn't say, okay, which gift you must desire? 
desire spiritual gifts all of them plural all of them desire spiritual gifts okay so when we study about the gifts we we understand that it is a manifestation of the spirit so what we are desiring is holy spirit you show yourself that is what we are desiring holy spirit come holy spirit you show yourself right so he's saying pursue love desire spiritual gifts okay okay uh Yes, personal edification, satisfying the church, edifying the church through interpretation. Um, okay, Shani's question. I think that's where we left off. Shani's question is: Okay, if you don't understand uh, when we pray in tongues, uh, doesn't the Bible say that you can ask for interpretation? Yes. So interpretation is when we when we sense that we are giving a message in tongues, or maybe group of believers we are together and then there is a you know message in tongues or your there is a song in tongues or something like that happening and uh, the holy spirit can give the interpretation for myself or for others right it can happen both ways either in a personal time or in a group setting so uh, if it's uh, a message in tongues definitely it, we need to ask for the interpretation otherwise the group or the church is not blessed if personally if i'm praying in tongues i can also you know ask the lord for the interpretation and i will receive the interpretation in my spirit it can be a sense of knowing it can be a prompting it can be a you know a scripture verse or something visual and in so many other ways right okay um tongues are for the church or for personal growth uh, if it's tongues with interpretation it is definitely edifying for the church uh, but if it's personal uh, tongues are for personal edification as we see in 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 4 right um, yeah stephen actually you were talking about the church yeah. in chapter 12 he is asking the question or suggesting for that this tongue is uh, good for the church or asking just a question because in chapter 14 4 he said uh tongue edified himself yeah. but he that prophesied edified the church yeah and the next verse he says i wish you all spoke in tongues but even more that you prophesied for he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification so tongues with edification uh in edifies the church so Sorry, it means the interpretation is very important when we speak in the church. In the church, yes. If it's a message yes. that you speak uh, in the church. And that's one of the guidelines that he says. No, if we speak. pray also, if we use any words in a tongue in the church, it's mm. necessary to translate that. Um, because so otherwise that is, some people will not understand. Yeah. Some people so, are coming. Yeah. So when we see that, um, if it is interpreted, it brings edification. But if you see the, um, the end of the chapter, um, verse 39, he says, do not forbid to speak with tongues. You know, even in a gathering, if people are praying, let it be between just, let it, be, let it between them and God. You know, as long as I'm praying in tongues softly, that I'm not, you know, kind of interfering with another person praying, uh, I can continue to pray in tongues, just between me and the Lord. But if I'm going to declare something, maybe uh, from the mic, if I'm going to declare something publicly, then having the interpretation is a guideline, is a scriptural guideline that the church might be edified. You're right. Okay, Shani. So I just I just have a question. I want to make sure I'm clarification kind of piggyback on what um, Stephanie asked. So is it okay when you're at, I mean, what if somebody's at church and they're praying and doing worship and they're speaking in tongues? Is are they supposed to have an interpreter? Or is just I mean, because sometimes they say you're not supposed to do that at church, you're not supposed to speak in tongues, you know, at church if there's no nobody interpreter. But when I go to church, I see people speaking in tongues, especially during worship. So that was my question. Yeah, so so if it is the with the understanding you know there's a gathering of believers you're gathering for prayer or you know maybe an all night prayer and you know you're seeking the lord and there is this understanding about 
the gift of tongues and uh, and what it does and so on. And then, you know, as a church, together we could sing out in tongues, we could seek the Lord praying in tongues, right? Now, now that is fine. But the Bible also talks about the fact, you know, if somebody is there up front and you, uh, if I'm going to be speaking in tongues, if I'm going to be, you know, from the mic addressing and addressing and uh, speaking to you in tongues, then there needs to be an interpretation. There needs to be an interpretation so that people are blessed. Otherwise, it's going to be, you know, that's what he deals with in the latter part of, uh, or the first part of chapter 14, right? He says, in the church, I would rather speak uh, a few words with the understanding rather than, you know, many words in tongues. So he's talking about addressing the gathering. Okay, so I'm understanding. So basically, if, if you're at church and you're worship and pray, you know, to praise and worship, it's okay. But if somebody just speaking to somebody else, there should be an interpretation. Am I understanding you right? Yeah. Okay. See, the thing is, yeah, because we see that occurrence twice, you know, in Acts chapter 2, uh, they all prayed in tongues. Um, in a, and also in, uh, that they were magnifying the Lord, right? And then we see in Cornelius' house also, they began to speak in tongues. Like, you know, they were actually speaking and magnifying God. And that's how they actually identified. So, yeah, this happens. But then when it comes to uh, addressing a message, it needs to be interpreted. Okay, Stephen. So you said about the Acts chapter 2, right? Yeah. When they sp spoke in tongues, the other people also understand what they were saying and that they were not Christian also. They were not Christian and other people understand what they are saying. And that's why the other people also came that day to yeah. accept the Christ. Right. So, so yeah, it was a sign. Tongues was a sign for the for the people who were there because it was a supernatural work which was pointing them to Christ. But we we see all kinds of reactions. If you notice, you know they were they were amazed that this kind of thing was happening. They were perplexed. They didn't understand it. But they were also mocking because some of the words because you know we know that tongues is you know much later when we we learn that okay it's earthly language it could be a heavenly language. But we also see that people were mocking, saying these people are drunk, right? So we, we know that there have been utterances which sounded very foreign, which could have been, you know, like gibberish. And, uh, and they said, hey, these people are drunk. So we see all those, you know, range of emotions and reactions from people. Um, yeah, that's true. But yeah, but it was a sign. It was a supernatural sign which pointed them uh, to to Jesus, to Christ. Of course, followed by the message that Peter shared, and then it actually got their attention. Yeah. Okay. Did I miss out on any questions here? Uh, did we address everything? So there will be more, um, uh, you know, uh, more sessions uh, if you signed up for Holy Spirit, and also you can watch the videos. Um, and um, you know, those of you who are on e-learning, of course, we can always interact, and all these questions can be uh, answered. Uh, and I'm sure you have the the publication, the book, APC book, the wonderful benefits of praying in tongues, right? So I would um, strongly recommend that you go through it. Uh, that also deals with all these frequently asked questions and, uh, you know, uh, and, and these kind of scripture verses, which normally um, people think, okay, you know, is, is it a problem? Now, okay, yeah, Stephen. Uh, verse 27, chapter 14, verse 27. Because mm -hmm. when you, um, in this chapter 14, end of the verse, mm -hmm. uh, verse 40, let all things be done decently and in order right yeah but when we come to verse 27 it said if any man speak in unknown tongue let it be by two or at the most by three mm -hmm. and that by course okay let one be translated uh, interpreter okay but, but in verse 28 it said yeah. if there is there be no interpreter let him keep silence in the church 
yeah and the other part of that verse is and let him speak to himself and to god yes so that's so yeah. uh, it's like uh, he is directly saying the paul is saying he should be silenced is there is no interpreter yeah so if But i if, if there's no yeah if there's no interpreter so his his thing of saying silence is if there's no interpreter let him speak to himself and to god personal edification can happen i can just pray in tongues and i can pray to the lord i can magnify god with tongues i can do that but i'm not going to come up front and speak or address the gathering in tongues so that's the you know verse this is the completion of verse 28 right and that is why in verse 39 he says do not forbid to speak in tongues he's speaking to the gathering but he's saying if you're going to be addressing there has to be interpretation but as long as you are worshiping and you are you know and in doing that let it be done decently and in order that's the um yeah that's the instruction thank you for pointing that out can you prophesy use your gifts at church if you're not a member of the church okay i think we'll take this last question and take a break um yes um you can prophesy um but if the prophecy uh, I, I, you know if the word is for something to do with let's say for the leadership or for the body right and the best way to do it is to submit it to the leadership right if it is for uh, the gathering if it is for the collective body to submit it to the leadership but if the lord would you know use you to bring a word of knowledge to bring a, a prophetic word um we can share but if it is of a nature where the leadership also needs to be uh, let's say taken into confidence then we can do do that but it um, depends on a case to case basis but yeah sure a prophetic word can be given right okay so uh, we'll take a break actually we wanted to pray uh, uh, for the baptism of the holy spirit but we'll take a break and then once we come back uh we will minister in prayer right is that okay okay thank you